Swan's Way, In Search of Lost Time, Volume 1, Cambrai 2, Part 2, by Marcel Proust. From a long way off, one could distinguish and identify the steeple of Saint-Hilaire, inscribing in its unforgettable form on a horizon beneath, which Cambrai had not yet appeared when from the train that brought us down from Paris at Easter time, my father caught sight of it as it slipped into every fold of the sky in turn, its little iron weathercock veering continually in all directions. He would say, Come, get your wraps together. We are there. And on one of the longest walks we took from Cambrai, there was a spot where the narrow road emerged suddenly onto an immense plain, closed at the horizon by strips of forest over which rose and stood alone the fine point of saint Hilaire's steeple. But so sharpened and so pink that it seemed to be no more than sketched on the sky by the fingernail of a painter anxious to give to such a landscape, to so pure a piece of nature, this little sign of art, this single indication of human existence. As one drew near, it and could make out the remains of the square tower, half in ruins which stood by its side, though without rivaling it in height, one was struck above all by the tone reddish and somber, of its stones. And on a misty morning in autumn, one would have called it to see it rising above the violet thundercloud of the vineyards, a ruin of purple, almost the color of a Virginia creeper. Often in the square as we came home, my grandmother would make me stop to look up at it, from the tower windows placed two and two, one pair above another, with that right and original proportion in their spacing to which not only human faces owe their beauty and dignity, it released, it let fall at regular intervals flocks of crows, which for a little while would wheel and caw, as though the ancient stones which allowed them to sport thus, without seeming to see them, becoming of a sudden uninhabitable and discharging some infinitely disturbing element had struck them and driven them forth. Then, after patterning everywhere the violet velvet of the evening air, abruptly soothed they would return and be absorbed in the tower, baneful no longer but propitious, some perching here and there, not seeming to move, but snapping up perhaps some insect on the points of turrets, as a seagull perches with an angler's immobility on the crest of a wave. Without quite knowing why, my grandmother found in the steeple of Saint-Hilaire that absence of vulgarity, pretension, and meanness, which made her love and deem rich and beneficent influences nature itself, when the hand of man had not, as did my great-aunt's gardener, trimmed it, and the works of genius and certainly every part one saw of the church served to distinguish the whole from any other building by a kind of general feeling that pervaded it. But it was in the steeple that the church seemed to display its consciousness of itself, to affirm its individual and responsible existence. It was the steeple that spoke for the church. I think, too, that in a confused way, my grandmother found in the steeple of Cambrai what she prized above anything else in the world, namely, a natural air, and an air of distinction. Ignorant of architecture, she would say, My dears, laugh at me if you like. It is not conventionally beautiful, but its bizarre old face pleases me. If it could play the piano, I am sure it would not sound dry. And when she gazed at it, when her eyes followed the gentle tension, the fervent inclination of its stony slopes, which drew together as they rose like hands joined in prayer, she would absorb herself so utterly in the outpouring of the spire 
that her gaze seemed to leap upward with it. And at the same time she smiled amicably at the worn old stones of which the setting sun illumined no more than the topmost pinnacles, which, at the point where they entered that zone of sunlight and were softened by it, seemed to have mounted suddenly far higher, to have become truly remote, like a song whose singer breaks into falsetto an octave above the accompanying air. It was the steeple of Saint-Hilaire that shaped and crowned and consecrated every occupation, every hour of the day, every point of view in the town. From my window, I could discern no more than its base, which had been freshly covered with slates. But when on Sundays I saw these, in the hot light of a summer morning, blaze like a black sun, I would say to myself, good heavens, nine o'clock. I must get ready for high mass at once if I am to have a go and kiss Leonie first. And I would know exactly what was the color of the sunlight on the square. I could feel the heat and dust of the market, the shade behind the blinds of the shop, into which Mama would perhaps go on her way to Mass, penetrating its odor of unbleached calico, to purchase a handkerchief or something of which the draper himself would let her see what he had bowing from the waist, and who, having made everything ready for closing up, had just gone into the back shop to put on his Sunday coat and to wash his hands. which it was his habit every few minutes, and even on the saddest occasions, to rub one against the other with an air of enterprise, cunning, and success. When after Mass, we looked in to tell Theodore to bring a larger brioche than usual because our cousins had taken advantage of the fine weather to come over from Tibercy to have lunch with us, we had in front of us the steeple, which baked and browned itself like a larger loaf still of holy bread, with flakes and sticky drops on it of sunlight, pricked a sharp point into the blue sky. And in the evening, as I came in from my walk, and thought of the approaching moment when I must say goodnight to my mother and see her no more, the steeple was by contrast so soft there at the close of day, that it looked like a brown velvet cushion laid against the pallid sky which had yielded beneath its pressure, had sunk slightly so as to make room for it, and had flowed back on either side, while the cries of the birds wheeling to and fro about it seemed to intensify its silence, launch its spire still higher, and invest it with something ineffable. Even when our errands lay in places behind the church, from which it could not be seen, the view seemed always to have been composed with reference to the steeple, which would stand up, now here, now there, among the houses, and was perhaps even more affecting when it appeared thus without the church. And indeed, there are many others which look best when seen in this way, and I can call to mind vignettes of housetops with surmounting steeples in quite another category of art than those formed by the dreary streets of Cambrai. I will not forget, in a quaint Norman town not far from Balbac, two charming eighteenth-century mansions, dear to me and venerable for many reasons, between which one looks up at them from the fine garden that descends in terraces to the river the gothic spire of a church, itself hidden by the houses, soars into the sky with the effect of completing and crowning their facades, but in a material so different, so precious, so annulated, so rosy, so polished, that it is as one seen to be no more a part of them than would be a part of two pretty pebbles lying side by side, between which it had been washed on the beach the purple crinkled spire of some seashell spun out into a turret and glazed with enamel. 
Even in Paris, in one of the ugliest parts of town, I know a window from which one can see across a first, a second, and even a third layer of the jumbled roofs of several streets, a violet bell. Sometimes ruddy, sometimes too in the finest prints, which the atmosphere makes of it of an ashy solution of black, which is, in fact, nothing else than the dome of St. Augustin and which imparts to this view of Paris the character of some of Piranesi's views of Rome. But since into none of these little engravings, whatever the taste my memory may have been able to bring to their exclusion, was it able to contribute an element I had long lost, the feeling that makes us not merely regard a thing as a spectacle, but believe in it as in a creature without parallel, so none of them keeps in dependence on it a whole section of my inmost life, as does the memory of those aspects of the steeple of Cambrai, from the streets behind the church. Whether we saw at five o'clock, when going to call for letters at the post office, some doors away from us on the left, raising abruptly with its isolated peak the ridge of house stops, or again, when we had got to go in and ask for the news of Madame Sarazat, our eyes following the line where it ran low again beyond the farther, descending slope, and we knew that we would have to turn at the second street after the steeple. Or yet again, if pressing farther afield, we went to the train station. We saw it obliquely, showing in profile fresh angles and surfaces like a solid body surprised at some unknown point in its revolution. Or from the banks of the vivant, the apse, drawn muscularly together and heightened in perspective, seemed to spring forward with the effort that the steeple had made to hurl its spire into the heart of heaven. It was always to the steeple that we had to return, always it that dominated everything else, summoning the houses from its unexpected pinnacle, raised before me like the finger of God, whose body might be concealed in the crowds of humans without any danger of my mistaking for that reason, them for it. And so, even today, in any larger provincial town or in a quarter of Paris that I do not know well, if a passerby who is putting me on the right road shows me from afar as a point to aim at some belfry of a hospital or a convent steeple lifting the peak of its ecclesiastical cap at the corner of the street that I am to take, my memory need only find in it some dim resemblance to that dear and vanished face. And the passerby, should he turn around to make sure that I have not gone astray, would see me, to his astonishment, oblivious of the walk that I had planned to take, or the place that I was obliged to call. Standing still on the spot before that steeple, for hours on end, motionless, trying to remember, feeling deep within myself, lands reclaimed from oblivion, slowly draining until the buildings rise on them again, and then no doubt, and then more uneasily than when just now I asked him for a direction. I seek my way again. I turn a corner, but the goal is in my heart. On our way home from Mass, we would often meet Monsieur Le Grandin, who, detained in Paris by his professional duties as an engineer, could only accept in the regular holiday seasons, visit his home at Cambrai between Saturday evenings and Monday mornings. He was one of that class of men who, apart from a scientific career in which they may well have proved brilliantly successful, have acquired an entirely different kind of culture, literary or artistic, of which they make no use in the specialized work of their profession, but by which their conversation profits. More literary than many men of letters, we were not aware at this period that Monsieur Le Grandin had a distinct reputation as a writer, and so were greatly astonished to find that a well-known composer had set some verses of his to music. 
endowed with a greater ease in execution than many painters, they imagine that the life they lead is not that for which they are really fitted, and they bring to their regular occupations either a fantastic indifference or a sustained and lofty application. Scornful, bitter, and conscientious. Tall, with a handsome bearing, a fine, thoughtful face, drooping blonde mustaches, a look of disillusionment in his blue eyes, an almost exaggerated refinement of courtesy, a talker such as we had never heard. He was in the eyes of my family, who had never ceased to quote him as an example, the epitome of a gentleman, who took life in the noblest and most delicate manner. My grandmother alone found fault with him for speaking a little too well, a little too much like a book, for not using a vocabulary as natural as his loosely knotted la verrier neckties, his short, straight, almost schoolboyish coat. She was astonished, too, at the inflammatory invective that he often launched at the aristocracy, at fashionable life and snobbishness, undoubtedly the sin of which St. Paul is thinking that he speaks of the sin for which there is no forgiveness. Worldly ambition was a thing that my grandmother was so little capable of feeling, or almost of understanding, that it seemed to her futile to apply so much heat to its condemnation. Besides, she thought it not very good taste that Monsieur La Grandin, whose sister was married to a country gentleman of Lower Normandy, near Balbac, should deliver himself of such violent attacks on the nobles, going so far as to blame the revolution for not having guillotined them all. Well met, my friends, he would say as he came toward us. You are lucky to spend so much time here. Tomorrow I have to go back to Paris, back to my niche. Oh, I admit, he went on with his peculiar smile, gently ironical, disillusioned, and vague. I have every useless thing in the world in my house there. The only thing wanting is the necessary thing, a great patch of open sky like this. Always try to keep a patch of sky above your life, little boy, he added, turning to me. You have a soul in you of rare quality, an artist's nature. Never let it lack what it needs.'